Number five, the Lurlian Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10 story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10 story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, two more. Another two are growing, yeah. Good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, AKA huge monster. Also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the World Serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay-per-view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah, Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg for sure. 
And also, the mind control. I don't know how sharks' brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred text now. The Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities, apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster. The Leviathan. The second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Cause apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature told by two different peoples? Oh, <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon, I think, would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the Twilight Zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate, yeah. And it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Number five on this list is the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, as many people refer to this creature, is said to be a huge, long-necked, almost dinosaur-looking creature that lives in Scotland. This creature of the deep specifically resides in Loch Ness, a 37-kilometer loch located in the Scottish Highlands. The legend of this sea creature went worldwide back in 1933. A photo was released to the public showing a strange creature's head protruding from the water of Loch Ness. The world went into a frenzy after that photo got out and the legend of Nessie began. Ever since that point, many sightings have been reported, other pictures have been taken, and even sonar readings have indicated this creature swimming in the loch. All of that being said though, we've never had indisputable proof that Nessie's real. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nessie is real, but maybe not how you expect. New Zealand scientists have taken samples of the water in Loch Ness and have studied the DNA that they found in it. Professor Neil Gamel, a geneticist, is quoted saying, well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material that says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might be a giant eel. So, the Loch Ness Monster, as we understand it, might not be real, but potentially this loch is full of giant eels that resemble all the features that Nessie's reported as having. Maybe this is why we've had such a hard time proving this myth, because for years, people have been looking for the wrong thing. I really like the legend of the Loch Ness Monster and honestly want it to be true, but if it had to be giant eels, 
then I think I could accept that as well. Number four on this list is the USS Stein Monster. The USS Stein was a Knox class destroyer ship in the United States Navy. The ship was eventually decommissioned from the American Navy and was transferred to the Mexican Navy in the 90s. That wasn't before it was attacked by a massive sea monster though. In 1978, the USS Stein was attacked by an unknown entity which we now refer to as the USS Stein Monster. This monster was said to have been a giant, with some people estimating its size up to 150 feet in length. The ship was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it was attacked. Technical difficulties with the ship started going wrong and eventually they brought it back into the port. Upon inspection, the sonar system was completely damaged. There were cuts and gashes over 8% of the ship with some of them being massively deep. They also found suction cups like those of a squid attached to the ship. After investigation of the suction cups and the gashes, it became clear that what they were attacked by isn't your standard animal. Even a giant squid would have had a hard time doing what the monster did to the ship. Ever since that point, the legend of the USS Stein monster has grown. Obviously, this monster has to be real because it has actually attacked a ship. Sadly, we don't know a whole lot about it though. In truth, we know less about what's on the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. So it's very possible that a creature we aren't familiar with yet is dwelling down there. Number three on this list is Megalodon. Would this list really be complete if I didn't include the ancient king of the sea? Eleanor Imster writes, Scientists think that Megalodon looked like a stockier version of the great white shark, with strong, thick teeth built for grabbing prey and breaking bones. Regarded as one of the largest and most powerful predators who have ever lived, fossil remains of Megalodon suggest that this giant shark reached a length of about 60 feet. Their large jaws could exert a bite force up to 24,000 to 41,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal, guys. Multiple times bigger than the great white sharks we have today. This thing was so big that it would actually eat entire whales. Now many myths have surrounded Megalodon and its existence since scientists first brought this mammoth of the sea up. Estimates say that Megalodon went extinct roughly 2.6 million years ago, but some people don't buy into that theory. For quite a while now, the legend of a giant shark still living amongst the ocean has had a lot of people wondering if it's possible. If Megalodon was still alive, is it possible that we still wouldn't know about it? How could we miss a creature this giant? How many of them would there be left in the waters? There are surely a lot of questions that come up if you believe Megalodon is still a reality. If this creature was still alive, then people think the Marianas Trench is where it's located, a place so deep and uncharted that it's hard for us to know for sure what's down there. I'm personally not convinced this creature still roams the ocean, but comment down below your thoughts. Is Megalodon still alive? What do you think? Number two on this list is the Kraken. The Kraken is one of the largest sea monsters that is said to exist. It all started in Nordic folklore many hundreds of years ago when sailors told tale of a massive beast that preys upon the waters of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This fearsome beast was said to pull entire ships to their doom and eat every human on board. The first account of the legend was in 1180 by the king of Norway at the time. Since then, sightings of the creature and lore surrounding its capabilities have grown through the years. Fiction writers and movie makers have also latched onto this creature and included it in many stories. As cool as it would be though, to our current knowledge, the crack in itself isn't real. However, something similar to it definitely is. The giant squid. The giant squid is a massive squid that's said to be able to grow up to 13 meters in length. Sightings have even put this creature at 20 meters before, but those have never been proven. Even if 13 meters is the maximum length, that's still a large animal and something that would frighten anyone if you're seeing it for the first time. Many experts believe that the legend of the Kraken happened when Norwegian sailors stumbled upon this giant squid, and rather than name it a giant squid, they called it the Kraken. As time went on, the legend spiraled out of control until we got this massive sea monster which attacks boats. Now even though that might be a bit far from the truth, could I believe that there was one giant squid that was potentially bigger than the rest? Absolutely I could. I could also believe that this giant squid might have attacked a ship or two in its time and maybe even brought one down. If it did do all of that, then there really wouldn't be any difference between this squid and the Kraken. Either way, if you see a massive sea creature with tentacles coming after you, I'd just swim the opposite direction. Number one on this list is the Hook Island Sea Monster. It was first spotted by Robert Le Sarek in 1964 off of Hook Island and after he saw the monster, he went on to describe it in detail. He said, 
It was only when we got to within 20 feet of the serpent that we could see its head clearly. The head was large, about 4 feet from top to bottom with jaws about 4 feet wide. The lower jaw was flat like that of a sandfish. The skin was smooth but rather dull, brownish black in color. The eyes seemed pale green, almost white. The skin looked more like that of a shark than an eel. There were no apparent scales nor did we see any parasites around. We supposed the flexible tail would have shaken any off. There were no fins or spines, nor were there any apparent breathing openings, although there must have been some. Perhaps we didn't see them because our attention was focused mainly on the creature's menacing mouth, the inside of which was whitish. The teeth appeared to be small. A fragment of some dark substance hung from the upper row of teeth, possibly a fish. As the monster was lying on the sandy bottom, we could not see the color of its belly. The creature was about 90 feet long. Behind the head, the body was about 2 feet 4 inches thick and remained that way for about 25 feet. Then it gradually tapered into a whip-like tail. The general color of the body was black with 1 foot wide brownish rings every 5 feet the first starting just behind the head. The skin was smooth, but dull. So that's his description, and after he and his family saw it, he took some pictures of the creature to prove his claims. We have to remember that these pictures were taken in 1964, and doctoring them would have been far more difficult back then than it is today. I also tend to believe this claim more than most based on the level of detail he described the beast. Obviously it was a pretty jarring experience if he was able to describe the creature in that much detail. Since the claims, people have researched Hook Island for this monster, but with no luck. Hopefully one day we can spot this monster again and know for certain that it truly exists. Number 5. Goblin Shark Under the sea is where nature starts to really let its creative juices flow. It's just an abstract world of tentacles, feelers, and razor sharp teeth down there. Like a Jackson Pollock, but for things that'll bite ya. I know that little crab said it's better down where it's wetter, but I just don't know if I agree if things like the goblin shark are swimming around freely. I know that sounds kind of like I have a strong opinion about these things, and I do. The goblin shark is probably one of the scariest looking living creatures on the planet. The translucent skin really isn't helping matters, I mean seriously. Google, try and find a cute photo of one of these things, even a little baby. Every single picture of it makes it look like something H.R. Giger would look at and think, hmm, maybe tone it down a bit. The goblin shark gets its name from its grotesque appearance. Sorry to all our goblin shark viewers, it's nothing personal. It's elongated nose and its unique unhinged jaws full of nail-like teeth. That nose isn't just for show either. It actually serves as a little prey detector for the goblin shark. The nose is filled with electroreceptors that allow it to pick up tiny electric fields of prey. It sneaks around the seabed using that little food finder to sniff out its next meal. Electrically charged tracking sharks with monstrous teeth. Wasn't that literally a joke in one of the Austin Powers movies? Goblin sharks actually can't even close their mouths fully with their teeth always being visible just to let you know what they're packing. I think as a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from any creature scientifically named after a goblin. That's advice that has done me well, that's advice that has served Spider-Man well, and I am passing that on to you. Having a good time so far? It would really make my day if you tossed a little old subscribe our way. Number 4. The Pacific Black Dragon Now this is an entry I could probably include solely on a name basis. You wouldn't even need to see a picture of it, and you just trust that the Pacific Black Dragon is a scary looking fish. However. I'm a visual learner, and you're watching a YouTube video, so we're going to include several pictures of one of Mother Nature's most precious little abhorrent monstrosities. Take a look at this thing. You would be forgiven for thinking that this thing popped out of that one guy's chest an alien, because it looks way more like a chest burster than it does a fish. And for those keeping track at home, that's my second reference to the 1979 sci-fi classic, and it probably won't be the last in this video. This angry little noodle, occasionally referred to as the Black Sea Dragon, gets its name from the fact that its skin absorbs 99.95% of the light in its habitat, which happens to be anywhere from 1600,000 feet to 6,000 feet below the depths. Meaning this thing is dark. It hides in plain sight in the pitch black water, letting the bait hanging from its chin attract prey. Smaller fish swim up to what they think is something appetizing. And then the last thing they ever see is two beady little glowing eyes and then nothing. While this little fish is one of the smallest monsters on our list, I don't trust a fish that learned how to fish. There's something traitorous about that behavior. And honestly, maybe it's shallow, but I just can't move on from how truly horrifying this thing looks. I'm vapid, I can admit that. And I would love to see the Megalodon snarf this thing up. Number 3. Japanese Spider Crab 
How do spiders manage to get into everything? Doesn't matter where you are, you will find a spider crawling around in your apartment, up your shower, on your walls, on the toilet seat. I thought we would have been safe at least in the ocean, but I really should have known better. Introducing the Japanese spider crab. A creature pulled directly from my nightmares in my therapy sessions. These things look like they crawled out of the dankest depths and can grow up to 12 feet long. They can grow up to be 40 pounds, and if somehow one of its many legs gets severed, they can just regrow those no problem when they molt next. They're not just one of the longest crabs in the world, they also have possibly the longest lifespan of any crab, with a spider crab living to up to 100 years old. You're telling me there's a crabby long legs walking around out there who was born in the 20s, still kicking about on the ocean floor? Moving his little bowler hat, spinning his little crabby cane. Now a little bit of cursory digging taught me two things about the spider crab to put my fears on ice. Apparently these monsters, despite their outward appearance, are completely benevolent and are more content to scavenge around the ocean floor looking for scraps than they are ever likely to interact with a human and are actually considered to be quite lazy by crab standards. Apparently they taste amazing and are considered a delicacy in some parts of Japan. I know for me, a key part of exposure therapy and getting over any of my fears is to eat my fears slathered in a buttery reduction, uh, prepared over rice, maybe with a nice soy sauce. I'm looking at more pictures and maybe I was totally wrong about the Japanese spider crab. I'm also very tall in a way that concerns people and I'm very lazy, usually scavenging for my next meal as well. Although I am hoping that my next meal is a spider crab sushi combo. Number two, stargazer. The stargazer is a fish that's got a face only a mother nature could love. And even then, it looks like she might not be that generous. This thing kind of looks like if you buried a pug up to its face and then left it out in the sun for a few months. I don't think it's even too much of a stretch to say this might very well be the ugliest fish on the planet. Now, it's not a crime to be the ugliest fish on the planet, and you certainly wouldn't make a list of terrifying creatures just for being a little bit ugly. The stargazer earned its place on this list for also being one of the meanest fishes out there. Oh, it's always the ones you least expect. The stargazer has defensive capabilities that make it sound a lot more like it's a Pokemon than a fish. These things will bury themselves in the ocean floor, turning themselves into a little trap and then using their massive mouths as a vacuum and sucking their unsuspecting prey right up. And if that wasn't enough of an evolutionary selling point for you, the stargazer also has electric organs at the top of it which transmit electric shocks to predators. That's a nasty little guy. And the name stargazer comes from the fact that when it's burrowing, it buries itself down and the only thing peering out is its ugly little eyes peering upwards at the sky or the stars. I gotta say, I got absolutely no love for these things. I like that they're very ugly, that's charming, but the rest of it, no. They're like scaly little zappy landmines. Number one, Portuguese man of war. Of all the things on this list, the Portuguese man of war seems like it's the most not from this planet. It looks beautifully ethereal, like something you'd see floating around in the background in a Star Wars planet or maybe hanging out with the blue things from Avatar. It's a truly cosmic looking wonder of nature. However, it is anything but. The first clue should be the fact that it is named after a 17th century battleship. It looks a bit like a jellyfish, but in actuality, it's a strange little colonial organism made up of smaller organisms called zooids. See, th this already sounds like I'm talking about an alien, a zooid. You gonna look me in the eyes and tell me a zooid is real? This thing actually isn't even an animal per se, but three organisms in a trench coat trying to sneak into the movies. The main zooid is a gas-filled translucent sac, which coincidentally is uh, what my 10th grade gym teacher used to call me to motivate me to run around the track faster. The gas-filled sac allows the colony to float. The man of war has no means of movement, instead having to rely on the currents of the ocean to direct it around. Real go with the flow type of organism. Not a bad attitude, to be honest. Now the next zooid, oh, <laughs> I am never gonna get used to saying that are the tentacles, which are really the star of the show here. The tentacles on a man of war reach lengths of up to 165 feet. Now I'll run that by you in case you heard that, fainted, and didn't quite catch what I said. Get up off the floor. Their tentacles can get up to 165 feet long. <laughs> That's really long. The tentacles, which mind you, carry a sting like a jellyfish's. It's been known to cause paralysis, is enough to kill a fish, and has been on some occasions enough to be lethal to humans. One Redditor recounts a painful story of a vacation to Cuba, strolling a beach and seeing what they thought was a plastic bag floating in the water, 
They then went to pick it up, and as they described, the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in a vinegar bath with a morphine drip, a team of doctors extracting the tentacles that were stuck into my hand. That's enough to keep me away from the water for a bit and maybe uh, prevent myself from ever doing a good deed, try to pick up some litter. I feel like even the Megalodon might want to be careful around this strange monster. Number 5, SCP-1128. Number 5 on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so... Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water, for good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mask great than 40 gram enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 in individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it is disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number 3, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with 3 meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the Foundation having to use high-powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835, pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of SCP-835's stomach. The crew members reported 
reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract. The insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh, and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the foundation. We thank him for his service. Number 2. SCP-1092 SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the blood stream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell, where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you, piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number 1. SCP-3000 SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any Foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by Foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the Foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the Foundation. <laughs>